Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar sponsored by the National Conference of State Legislatures, Natural Resources and Infrastructure Committee. Um, just hang tight and we will get going shortly. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for today's National Conference of State Legislatures webinar, State Outdoor Recreation, Climbing to New Heights. My name is Jennifer Schultz, Program Principal in NCSL's Environment, Energy and Transportation Program, and I will be your moderator. This is the fourth webinar in a series of five sponsored by NCSL's Natural Resources and Infrastructure Committee this spring. We have one more webinar which will focus on the most common threats to energy systems and the response from state and federal government as well as the energy industry. To register for that webinar or to view recordings of past webinars, please visit our website at ncsl.org. Before I introduce our speakers, I have a few housekeeping items to go over. First, I encourage you to participate through the chat box, which is located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Feel free to type your questions at any time during the presentations. We will address as many as we can at the end. For now, I invite you to type in the state where you are joining us from. I am in a sweltering hot Colorado. Our webinar uh, today is being recorded and registrants will be able to access the recording on NCSL's website shortly after the webinar is over. With that, let's jump into our topic today, outdoor recreation. Over the past year, the outdoors have taken on even greater importance, functioning as a space of refuge and relief to many during the pandemic. This webinar will explore the outdoor recreation economy and highlight state and federal policies and programs to maximize opportunities for outdoor enthusiasts across the country. And we have no shortage of experts in the virtual room today. In order to save some time, I will drop a PDF of speaker bios into the chat in a minute. Um, but first up, here we go. First up, we have Jessica Turner. She is the Executive Director of the Outdoor Recreation Roundtable, a coalition of outdoor recreation trade associations and organizations comprised of 31 national association members serving over 100,000 businesses. Ms. Wall has over a decade, Ms. Turner, has over a decade of experience in outdoor recreation spanning the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. Jessica, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me today. And thanks so much um, for the great interest in outdoor recreation uh, from NCSL and all of you uh, listening in. So I'm Jessica Wall Turner and any last name is fine. I'm, I'm confused too, which, which last name I have. Uh, and as Jen mentioned, I'm the executive director of Outdoor Recreation Roundtable. We're now actually 34 uh, national trade associations representing the entire breadth of the outdoor industry, everything from um, 
RVing and scuba diving to camping, biking, hiking, and horse pack. So um, we have 110,000 businesses in our uh, sphere. Here's a list of all of our members. And we really work uh, together. It's just been three years now since we formed to make the recreation pie bigger. Instead of fighting over the slices of the pie of you know biking versus ATVing or snowmobiling versus skiing, we're trying to uh, create more access and opportunity for all activities through improved infrastructure and sustainable funding um, for a, a really robust recreation future. So we've come together uh, to show what a $788 billion economy looks like. Um, this is uh, government data from the Bureau of Economic Analysis that we get annually. Um, and we are growing faster than the economy as a whole in every indicator. We're 2.1% of the US GDP, contributing more to the economy than industries like agriculture, mining, and utilities. Um, one of the numbers I love the most is jobs. Uh, we directly account for 5.2 million American jobs, which is about 3.3% of all uh, employed uh, of all employees in the US, which is higher in a lot of states. Most states, um, I think some that I saw in the chat are actually way higher than 3%. Um, and we uh, employ more people than real estate, uh, than legal services, and are equivalent to healthcare. So it's a huge and robust industry. Through our collective businesses, we are in every corner of the country. We're a true force behind healthy people, the planet, healthy communities, and healthy economies. Uh, and we're bringing together the business voice. So we're in a really unique space where um, we can bring in federal agencies. We work with the Park Service and DOI, state agencies, um, and elected officials and nonprofits to create uh, bipartisan solutions for the challenges um, facing our uh, economic growth and also to celebrate the opportunities that we have at the local and national levels. So here's a, a look at the state breakdown. We actually have data for every state in the entire country. And each state has a really unique recreation economy. Uh, Indiana, you might see, is, is, is pretty dark blue. That's the RV capital of the world. More RVs are made there than anywhere else um, in the world. And they are distributed to the US and other countries. So they have a really uh, interesting manufacturing recreation economy there. Wyoming, also dark blue, uh, has a lot of travel and tourism related to recreation because of the national parks and access to great outdoor spaces. So two robust recreation economies based on very different things. You can also slice and dice the data um, by industry sector. So boating, fishing, RVing, leading the way, but obviously, you know, equestrian and camping, fishing, hunting, um, really high up there as well. And don't count any state out for having a, a unique recreation economy. When we were digging through the data, we found that Florida has a pretty robust uh, ski recreation economy. And we were thinking that's not possible. You don't really ski in Florida. Well, again, it's a ski manufacturer that's based in Florida. And so um, it's really interesting to look at that data. I encourage everyone to go on the Bureau of Economic Analysis website or our website and, and dig in a little bit better. I, I think in general, the data shows that we're not a nice to have um, on the weekend. We are a real industry that's needed um, in every state and because of our jobs, but also because of the indirect jobs. So we talk a lot about recruitment and retention. Um, and I love to give the examples of, of Salt Lake City and, and JP Morgan uh, getting a bank, um, one of their branches in Salt Lake City headquartered because they want, they know that young people want to live near the mountains and they want to ski on the weekends and, and hike and bike and fish. Um, Livingston, Montana has become a technology hub for healthcare uh, because the um owners of these of these huge healthcare tech companies just want to live where they can fish and hunt. Uh, and then Fayetteville, um, we've got some folks I think on from West Virginia, what an incredible uh, opportunity to have New River Gorge is a new national park site and um, they're really incentivizing people to come uh, who, who would go there for, um, you know, trips to live there and a lot of people, a couple of my friends from DC have moved their companies down to West Virginia for quality of life because it's near great recreation assets. Um, so this economic data that I just shared uh, was from 2019 and a lot has changed in the past year. Last May, the Census Bureau actually named uh, recreation as the second most impacted um, industry next to food and accommodation because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and you can uh, go to the next slide. We had entire supply chains disrupted. Um, local, state, and federal public lands and waters that serves the backbone of our industry were closed, um, along with the service providers that really rely on people going to those places. So uh, last year, a year from today, 88 of our businesses laid off our furloughed employees, 94% saw a decrease in revenue, and virtually all of our businesses, 100%, um, had trouble with distribution and supply chain issues. So we stepped up to make sure the CARES Act worked for our seasonal businesses, 
led calls with the land management agencies and industry leaders on effective and safe ways to keep public lands um, and recreation assets open to the public through public-private partnerships, and engaged governors, um, which was really important, uh, and state legislators on conversations around the importance of ensuring people could get outside in, in a safe and healthy way for uh, you know exercise and stress relief, um, but also you know keeping our manufacturing facilities open so we could continue to provide our essential business services. So at the same time that most industries were shuttering their doors, Americans were turning to the outdoors like they never have before for health and for fitness, um, for solace, for safe ways to see friends and families. So if you've tried to buy a bike or an RV, a boat, fishing gear, a tent in the past year, you've probably seen what I'm talking about here, some great stats. Um, and the side uh, bar here that I'm not gonna go over, but we saw that 81% of Americans said that they had an outdoor recreation experience uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and this is an uptick from about 50% has been our um, annual data for people having outdoor experience. So around 32% new users uh, because of the pandemic really prioritizing getting outside. We've been uh, trying to grow as an industry participation uh, for decades um, and it, it sort of happened all in one year, um, the influx of new participation turned into license sales and, and uh, park passes, um, equipment sales, and um, the good news didn't stop there. New participants actually tended to be younger and more diverse. Um, and that's great for an industry really eager to harness um, new energy uh, and create lifelong outdoor enthusiasts, but also a, a, a workforce trajectory. So camping was viewed as the safest way to travel. Forest Service reported record highs. Um, in most of their uh, locations. Uh, Metro Park saw visitation increasing from six to 145%. Um, and about 15% of new anglers were Hispanic and about 70% of new anglers and voters were women. So um, really trending uh, in the right direction on that. Uh, however, with increased participation, we can go to the challenges. Um, it's really impacting recreation, uh, the experience and the sustainability of our public lands and waters, which is something that I know we'll talk about in a little bit through the America's Great Outdoors Act, which will be beneficial. Um, but we have serious conservation, wildlife, climate uh, concerns mounting that need to be addressed while keeping the doors open for businesses and the enjoyment of the public. And at the same time, we have the long term funding and conservation issues that are going to come up with um, uh, LWCF. Um, a possibly you know, with less at our continental shelf drilling with um, the fuel tax that comes from our, our vehicles and our boats uh, that goes to uh, conservation as we turn to electric. So lots of long-term discussions um, to be had. And also the, you know, the equity gap, I think we saw this pretty dramatically as governors came on our screens every day and said, hey, don't go far, but stay close to home and get outside. It's important that you get vitamin D and exercise during this time um, of COVID. We saw that about 100 million people didn't have access to a local green space. Um, and, and those, you know, communities were some of the most uh, in need. So while we saw overcrowding on one hand, we definitely saw um, the lack of ex access and equity. Um, looking at park size and density, really shines a light on this disparity. So 14,000 cities and towns analyze parks that serve a majority of people of color, average half the size, um, and they serve uh, five times as many people. So we're thinking a lot about how do we retain um, you know, this new and diverse user base and all the people that really enjoyed getting outside as they go back to perhaps international travel or longer commute times, um, the, their normal life. And then the real test is how do we harness all this energy um, and create lifelong enthusiasts uh, while limiting the impact on our resources. So we're thinking about a lot of these things and also um, building a 21st century workforce. And this is something I really think the, the state workforce investment boards um, and, and state and local governments can, can help with. We have 35,000 job openings in the boating industry alone, and that's an old number. It might be more. So there's a real skills gap that's widening on, on the technologies that we need uh, in our industry and, and what people are leaving a two-year or four your institution with or, or um, you know, high school degree. So we'd love to work um, with legislators interested in this and, and local uh, academic and universities. We have a couple companies that, uh, big companies that have been um, in my ear lately saying that they could double in size in, in rural communities in the next couple of years, but they won't because of workforce. So we're, we're running into this real desire for people to get outside by American made products and we can't make them here because um, we don't have the, the people with the skills. So we'd love to continue to work with you all on that. And, and it's really where, um, you know, we're working with the states and I think where um, state and local policy can, can just have wonderful initiatives that bubble up to national policy, 
or good policy can be adopted across all states. Um, next slide. And a great example of that is the state offices of outdoor recreation where we're talking about some of this workforce uh, issues. So from east to west, red to blue, uh, there's about 17 across the country. We have Pitt here um, who's speaking next. Utah was actually the first office of outdoor recreation. And what's really exciting is these are established leadership leadership positions within state governments um, to help develop recreation opportunities and support recreation related policies, uh, especially as it pertains to economic development. And it brings together the siloed agencies because when you think about recreation, it's not just natural resources or fish and game, it's commerce and labor and education and transportation um, and, and many more agencies. And so this person um, is, is really bringing together all of those folks to think about recreation holistically and to think about it as an economic driver. Uh, bringing these states together to share best practices is the National Governors Association Outdoor Recreation Learning Network, which ORR is a sponsor of. And this is really sort of the hub and the brain share of the best ways that state governments and governors can support um, this burgeoning uh, recreation economy. So you can go on their website and learn a lot more and, and see some of their resources. We also have a lot of success stories since uh, states have come up with these offices of outdoor recreation. There's a bunch here. There's a lot on our website. Um, I'll highlight just a few. Uh, Pitt has great examples because Utah is one of the, the shining gold standards, but uh, Colorado has an outdoor recreation office and they were really driving task force with the governor, governor um, there to keep outdoor recreation open responsibly during COVID. Um, we have a great grant program in New Mexico, the New Mexico Equity Fund that's been um, um, incredibly uh, uh, positive um, for communities there. We've done economic and workforce development. We had a great Michigan supplier summit that um, connected Michigan suppliers to manufacturers and distributors in the state to create a stronger network there. Um, and one of the really exciting things that happened an hour ago in Michigan um, was the governor uh, committed $250 million of their rescue plan money to state parks and trails, knowing that that's a really important part um, of COVID-19 recovery. So uh, in addition to the great things happening at the state, one of the, at the state level of these offices, one of the things that we've um, been committed to is really rural economic development and worked with the state directors and, and many, many stakeholders, mayors across um, local, state and federal communities to develop um, a rural recreation program out of ORR. Uh, we partnered with EPA, USDA, the Forest Service, the Northern Border Regional Commission um, to provide technical assistance and guidance to communities who have really stepped up and said, you know, we want recreation to be our future. We have traditional economies or um, we have economies that have gone away and we need to diversify or, or we need to, to shift so that we have jobs and we have a robust economic future. Um, uh, a very, uh, you know, shortly lived RFP went out, 170 communities applied and said, Creation is our economic future and only 10 were able to be funded through the government program. So we've partnered with the VF Foundation um, to help support some more communities getting um, on the ground technical assistance that's really authentic um, to, to what they want to look like. Not every community wants to have a, a recreation economy like a Moab and that's that that's fine. And, and what does this recreation economy um, want to be and how can we help them get there? And so that's a great grant program that we're going to continue to invest in and look forward to working with um, communities that you work with who are interested in this. And then additionally, we have this recreation um, uh, toolkit that's available for everyone, not just communities that were part of this pilot program. It's input from hundreds of stakeholders. We actually had 900 groups on our uh, webinar launch. So there is real interest in creating recreation economies across the country. I think we had folks from every state uh, and territory on that. Um, and we've been really thrilled with the outpouring of support from this. We have a list of federal resources that support uh, rural economic development. And um, we're just getting started with this type of work. So would love uh, your feedback and your engagement. Um, and, and we'd love to know if your community needs support. We're really trying to link uh, federal, state, and um, uh, private sector dollars uh, so that we can make the most of it. One of the best stories, and I'll, I'll leave it with this, that came out of um, one of these communities we supported a grant for $5,000 uh, to the community from, from ORR unlocked about $70,000 in state and federal funding because they were able to show that there was a match, they were able to show there was buy-in, they were able to convene um, local and state uh, stakeholders. And so uh, just a small grant, just a small, you know, technical assistance support can really help a community unlock their rural recreation economy. Um, and with that, uh, I'll, I'll thank you for your time and look forward to talking more and, and hearing from Pitt and his great work. Thank you, Jessica. That was great information. 
Next up, we have Pitt Brewey. He is the director of the Office of Outdoor Recreation for the state of Utah. A Utah native, he has worked in the outdoor industry for almost 15 years, including leadership roles in marketing and sales for Bibby.com, Goal Zero, and Petzl. He founded a kayak school and worked many years at Utah's Canyons Resort. Pitt, go ahead. Thanks, Jennifer. Appreciate it. And thanks, Jess. As you can tell, Jess is a huge wealth of information and data and a great partner organization, and, and we are happy to be a part of ORR. I'm uh, coming to you today from Cedar City, Utah. If any of you have visited Cedar City, uh, you'll know how special it is. If you haven't, I would put it on your bucket list of places to visit. We're celebrating a new trail system that um, just continues to expand and, and is really bringing world-class mountain biking and hiking uh, right outside of town here. So exciting to be here today. And, and I'm, I'm grateful for this time to, to, to talk with all of you. Um, as mentioned, I'm Pitt Gruy. I'm, I'm the director of the Utah Office of Outdoor Recreation. Utah was the first Office of Outdoor Recreation uh, and it was formed in 2013. Um, and really with the foresight of, of seeing the importance of the outdoor recreation is playing in the state of Utah into many different aspects of the economy. So like Jess talked about, outdoor recreation is typically seen as a tourism economic driver, but what we're finding here in Utah is the quality of life uh, that outdoor recreation brings to the residents and visitors of Utah is really what's driving the economy. We uh, recently did a study with Kempsey Gardner Institute and, and a partner organization, um, Utah Outdoor Partners, where they measured the importance of outdoor recreation to tech industry employees. As you know, Utah has a quite a big tech sector, a lot of software companies and things and silicon slopes here. And they surveyed all of these employees from that sector and they found that 90% of them, 91% of them actually said that outdoor recreation was the number one reason why they chose to either stay and work in Utah or relocate to Utah or come back to Utah if they had left it. So the number one reason, the number two reason was family. So, I mean, I know there's a lot of family people out there, but uh, obviously outdoor recreation may be more important than family. I'm just kidding. Don't quote me on that. But we, we you know, as far as it, it beat out career advancement, it even um, beat the cost of living. Outdoor recreation was the number one reason why they chose to live to Utah. So as you can see, we it plays an important role in how in many different sectors and the growth, the economic growth of all these different sectors, whether that is the financial industry, the tech industry, manufacturing, healthcare industry, all of that, really the priority is the access to the outdoors and to, and to wild places. The mission of our office is to ensure that Utahns can live a, a healthy and active lifestyle through outdoor recreation. We wanna make sure that everybody has access to the wonderful public lands that our state has and also different activity types to fit their ability, needs, and desires. Next slide. So what is the what is the really the direct purpose of our, the Office of Outdoor Recreation? And I'm going to dive in a little bit more to a couple examples of other states as well. Just highlighted a few and I'll, I'll dive a little bit deeper into that. But for Utah, uh, the purpose of outdoor recreation is to coordinate outdoor recreation policy management and promotion across the state. So because of that, we work very closely with the Office of Tourism, but also with the offices of natural resources, state parks, fish and wildlife, uh, economic development. We lie in the governor's office of economic development, but then also helping to create policy around best practices to make sure that we're protecting our, our assets and, and keeping access open to our public lands. We support cor corporate recruitment and retention uh, a lot of businesses are interested in bringing uh, businesses to Utah, not only because of our location in proximity to national parks and, and public lands and ski resorts and everything else, but also International Airport right in Salt Lake City, which is close to get to, and the distribution benefits and hubs, and that Utah is a very business-friendly state in, in with, uh, with opportunities for businesses to come here and grow and, and be incentivized to, to continue to grow here in Utah. 
Um, we expand outdoor recreational assets. And I'll jump into this in a minute, talking about kind of one of our biggest uh, roles and successes. And then we inspire Utah, Utahns, especially youth, to engage in outdoor recreation. The state legislature in 2019 passed a uh, resolution to create the Every Kid Outdoors initiative, which really helps us to uh, integrate outdoor education and learning into our school systems, into after school programs, and to get as many kids outside as possible to learn to uh, be healthy and respect our natural places. So um, as, as uh, Jess mentioned, we are one of 14 states that has a, an official office of outdoor recreation. We call ourselves the confluence of states and really our goal is, is a handful of principles. Number one is we support the establishment of future offices of outdoor recreation. So if you talk to any uh, director or member of an office of outdoor recreation across this, uh, the country, you will know that they talk to a lot of different states that are looking to do the same thing, right? I get phone calls or emails all the time saying, hey, we wanna, we wanna start an office of outdoor recreation in our state. What are the steps we need to to talk to our legislators to get that? To happen or what are some of the bullet points and, and points we need to make so we as the confluence of states we all help to assist in that um, to build our strength because then at a, at a national and federal level right we are able to support jess and her movement and 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 things that really can help to change the landscape for outdoor recreation nationally we're guided by some common principles and accords um, i was uh, one of those is conservation and stewardship second education and training third, economic development, and fourth, public health and wellness. The great thing about the confluence of states is that we all have the ability to um, come together about outdoor recreation, even though we come from states that are very different politically. Um, you know, whether that's Colorado versus Utah, I shouldn't say versus, but next to Utah, you know, definitely different politics in each state. Um, or an eastern state versus western state, um, where you know a, where we have a lot of public lands out here west and in the east, they're dealing with you know uh, private lands and and access and easements. We're all able to support each other and give great um, you know solutions and and problem solve together by working together as as a confluence of states. Next slide. So let me talk about some of uh, the states, some of these members of the confluence, some of the greatest uh, accomplishments. Of course, I'm going to talk about Utah first, um, but Utah Infrastructure Grants, what we call our UORG grants. So this was a program that was established in 2015, and it, it uses tourism dollars, it uses um, hotel tax um, dollars, going, we take a little bit of that into a fund, which then we redistribute um, throughout the state to help build outdoor recreation infrastructure. So we're talking about trail systems, fishing docks, boat ramps, um, cross-country ski courses, uh, trailheads, you know, you name it. We, we basically service about 26 different activity types here in the state of Utah because we do have so much to do here, whether it's biking, climbing, ATV riding, fishing, hunting, all of that. So since 2015 to this year, we have distributed over $23 million um, from this fund. The great thing about that is it's a match grant. And so we, we have a 50-50 grant requirement, but a lot of times the communities are leveraging our match to, to get much more in donations and, and matching dollars. So the project value total has been 169 million. So really this, grant program has helped to get $169 million invested in outdoor recreation across the state um, over the last six years. Like I said, seven to one private public um, leverage, 312 different projects have been awarded in this time. And 65% of that funding has gone to rural um, areas of Utah. Our grant only funds communities, counties, uh, municipalities, or nonprofits. So the grant does not go towards any federal land agencies or anything else. But what we find is is a great catalyst for these communities to work with federal land agencies. So for example, a nonprofit trail organization or county will 
work with the Forest Service in their area to use the land on the Forest Service, but also design, build, and create a great trail system for hiking and mountain biking. So really is a great collaborative effort and, and it really is the, one of the biggest successes of our office and, and something that is growing with popularity every year. From the first year where we had a hundred thousand or a few hundred thousand dollars in away this past year, we were able to give away $7.5 million um, because of the demand and the excitement around it. So really great program here in Utah. Next slide. Just to highlight a couple of these other ones um, to show you examples of the type of work that offices of outdoor recreation work on. Um, Jess mentioned this one, the New Mexico Outdoor Equity Fund, but this was a $100,000 appropriation from their legislature um, that grew to over $870,000 um, with a mix of public and private. And it, it is uh, already invested in 26 New Mexico programs. So these are programs that help kids and underprivileged communities get outside. It's helped about 3,000 kids already in, in 2020 um, or in last summer. And you know they raise private donations from the Wilderness Society, Turner Foundation, RII, the North Face. So really uh, key to this is the relationship that the offices of outdoor recreation have with the private industry and the private sector, um, whether that's outdoor industry, conservation, um, and then some of these larger um, corporations that, that are there to support outdoor recreation. And you can see more details on this um, at that website. Colorado also, again, to, they have really leaned on the outdoor industry and their relationships and partnerships with the private sector to help with the Colorado Rural and Technical Assistance Program. So this is helping communities to diversify their economy through outdoor recreation industry. So not just getting, again, more visitors and tourism into these communities, but how do they bring businesses that are gonna bring jobs and employees um, and really set up shop in some of these rural communities. So 13 communities have taken advantage of this. And again, the, the role is to help rural communities identify their competitive advantage and recruit businesses. Um, so think of this program and, and something that we do, right? You know that every, at least here in the Western United States, all these businesses, when you look at a company that sets out recruitment goals or, or a job posting, say it's for Adobe here in Utah, um, you know, a big tech company, they will always, um, they will always complement those job postings or things with things like, oh, you're 20 minutes from world-class skiing and you have trails right out your back door. And on the weekends, you can visit the national parks in Utah, all of these things. So they realize that those are assets for recruitment. What this program does is help these rural communities say, look, we're a gateway community to national forest land or to BLM land. Um, all of these things that you can utilize to help recruit your staff and get people to have a high quality of life and, and living uh, in those communities. Next, um, North Carolina Stewardship Initiative. So their goal with this is to unite tourism partners and outdoor recreation industry to help protect the state's natural assets. Um, it's this, if we protect our natural assets, it protects the quality of life and it's essential in attracting talent workforce for our states and diverse sectors of the industry. So as you can see, all of the state's offices of outdoor recreation are finding unique ways to stimulate the economy in their states through uh, utilizing the great asset that is the access to outdoor recreation. And that's one thing that as in the state of Utah that we are always trying to do and what we say is elevate outdoor recreation is to bring to the forefront that it's not just a fun weekend activity, but it really is an economic driver across so many sectors. And every state that has one of these offices is realizing that and helping to push that message forward, which then brings jobs, quality of life um, is higher and helps to really diversify the economy to different businesses and sectors. Next. So real quick, let me just add a few things here. We in our office of, uh, at Utah, um, we do a handful of things to help educate and really network. We have the Utah Outdoor Recreation Summit. So this is an, a, a gathering place and this is a great place to start. Maybe if you don't have an office of outdoor recreation in your state, 
holding these events to start bringing the stakeholders together is a great place to start, even if it's just a task force or a commission or something that, that is in charge of these. But when the conversations, when you can bring people together, that's when the conversations happen and that's when things can move. So the summit is a gathering place for all sectors of the outdoor recreation industry in Utah to connect, learn and grow. And we build together um, what the future of recreation and the future of our public lands look like in our state. This means that we're pulling together industry. So brands that are making backpacks and boats and everything else, they're coming to meet with land managers, with community organizers, with tourism officials, uh, with nonprofits, conservation groups, all of us get in the same space and have really valuable conversations and, and discussions around this. Uh, the Outdoor Recreation Summit typically has about 500 to 600 people that attend each year. We do it in different locations around the state um, and really has grown to be a premier event and, and really a great uh, way for people to network and connect. We do the same thing with Summit Speaker Series, which we hold every few weeks. They've been digitally the last few year or the last year or virtual, um, but we are able to, again, have conversations about specific issues, whether that's land management issues or, or stewardship issues to how do we help grow our businesses in the outdoor uh, recreation space. I encourage all of you, if you're interested, to reach out to me to come to one of those events um, and, and check it out for yourself. The summits this year will be held in September and October here in Utah. Um, lastly, I just want to mention the importance of the economy, the outdoor recreation economy here in Utah. So you can see some stats here. 83,000 jobs uh, are, are brought here directly to the outdoor recreation economy. Again, secondarily, how many jobs are, are sparked here because of the access to outdoor recreation in different sectors. Um, outdoor recreation, the GDP, you know, continues to increase in the, in that economy. Um, snow, snow sports visitors spend $1.5 billion in our state each year. National park visitors spend $1.2 billion. And again, it's the number one reason why people choose to live and work in Utah. Um, you know, so again, it, it is a key asset to every aspect of the economy. If you have ideas, questions, want to know more about uh, establishing an office or a task force or events around that, please reach out to me. If you're coming to Utah, reach out to me. I'd love to uh, take you around and, and spend some time in the mountains or the desert here in Utah. Um, and we're open to answer any questions and help you. But again, thanks for your time today. And, and I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity. So thank you. Thank you, Pitt. Um, our third speaker is Representative Jamie Becker Finn of Minnesota. Representative, I understand that you have some slides you would like to share today. Um, I don't have slides. Uh, I apologize. I am also the chair of our House Judiciary Committee, and we are still in the middle of budget negotiations here in the Minnesota legislature. So um, I, I, I didn't have time to put slides together uh, for you all, but I, I do have a website I'll share in, in a second if that's okay. That's fine. Go right ahead. We'll just look at this lovely lake view. <laughs> all right. Uh, so uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, as, as Jennifer noted, uh, my name's Jamie Becker Finn. I'm a, in my third term as a state representative uh, in the state of Minnesota. Uh, I grew up in rural Minnesota. I am a Leech Lake Ojibwe descendant, grew up uh, on the same reservation, on the same land as uh, many generations of my family, but now live in the, in the Twin Cities metro area, and that's the district that I represent. Um, I am also, as someone who grew up in rural Minnesota, I am an avid uh, hunter and angler and uh, even recently became certified as a firearm safety instructor uh, through our Department of Natural Resources. Um, so a couple things that I, I was asked to speak, uh, I am the chief author of the No Child Left Inside uh, grant program uh, that we successfully passed two years ago in Minnesota. Uh, but a couple things I wanted to touch on that are unique uh, about what we have in Minnesota is so uh, obviously we're uh, known as the, the land of 10,000 lakes. We actually technically have more than that, uh, but uh, you know, hunting, uh, hunting and fishing are, are important uh, to, to Minnesotans. And we have 
two different funding streams that are unique to Minnesota uh, that directly impact uh, outdoor spaces and outdoor recreation. And so one of those is we have uh, what's called our legacy fund. Uh, it was a constitutional amendment passed uh, about a little over 10 years ago in Minnesota that increased our sales tax by three eighths of a percent. Um, and this has allowed uh, over a billion dollars to be spent, spent through our outdoor heritage fund. And that is uh, specifically in our constitution dedicated to protecting, enhancing and restoring habitat for wildlife, uh, game and fish. And so we, we have that uh, revenue stream that we're able to invest in our outdoor spaces. And then we also have our, uh, the Minnesota state lottery system uh, generates a lot of money as well. And those hundreds of millions of dollars are also um, a percentage of that is also dedicated uh, to uh, a citizen commission that makes recommendations about how to spend um, how to spend those dollars. And often that is used also in our outdoor spaces, um, clean water, uh, things to that that regard. So despite having uh, you know, access to resources that many states do not. Um, and despite being a very outdoor centered uh, state, we actually have uh, hunting and fishing are actually preserved as rights in our state constitution. Uh, we have struggled for a really long time in uh, making sure that everybody in our state has equitable access to those places and spaces and activities. And uh, I, as a mom, I have two kids in elementary school. Uh, it, um, we decided to start with with our youngest our youngest Minnesotans and uh, so we started the No Child Left Inside grant program and that is what uh, the website I'm going to share with you here. Uh, so uh, No Child Left Inside uh, is we set it up two years ago. It is focused on public entities, so uh, as well as tribes uh, located in Minnesota. And the, the most important part here is the, the priority system that we set up. And this is has worked well, and we were able to get this through uh, in a bipartisan manner. Uh, we, are, we are the only uh, divided legislature uh, in, in the country. And so we, uh, we've operated in that space for a long time. So we really need to be able to do things in a very bipartisan manner in order to get things done. And so this program, you know, instead of, um, unfortunately, the word equity is uh, not a word that some uh, folks uh, want to support. And so what we did is we focused focused on framing it as being targeted at kids who otherwise would not have access to these outdoor experiences. So uh, it's not aimed at kids like mine, who I already bring outdoors and, and bring camping and fishing and uh, hunting and hiking. It's aimed at kids who otherwise don't have those opportunities. And so uh, there were two different grant programs, a, a smaller grant program of up to $5,000 and then a larger grant program of up to $50,000. And what we found two years ago was that the demand for these grants was so intense that we had to stop taking uh, applications uh, from organizations and schools uh, the first day that we opened the program. We had, uh, the system was essentially flooded and we had to just stop um, before we even hit the end of business on that first day. So certainly the demand is there. Um, and the other thing that I, I wanted to share is just to give sort of an idea of how some of these grant dollars are, um, are, are spent is what we learned. So in Minnesota, we're, uh, it's very hot here right now. It's I think like most of the country, it's, uh, it's in the 90s and not particularly comfortable right now, but we spend a lot of our, uh, a lot of our year uh, under snow uh, and with frozen lakes. And so we, we had a lot, this is just an example of uh, places throughout, uh, throughout our state that receive these dollars. <laughs> I apologize, my husband just walked in the door uh, and the dogs needed to tell us about it. Um, and so most of these are actually in rural Minnesota, which I think is important. Um, and it really could be anything. Um, this particular program here at this charter school, um, they took primarily the kids who attend that charter school are new immigrant families. And so we had families who'd never even walked onto a frozen lake before. And now we're, um, teaching those kids how to go ice fishing. And the other thing we learned is that um, a lot of the access issues, we think it's um, it's sort of this larger issue of like, oh, well, they don't own a boat or, you know, they don't uh, have the, you know, the actual materials, but it's in Minnesota, it was what we found is that a lot of it was 
the kids don't even have snow pants or they don't have the right outdoor gear just for, to keep their bodies warm. And so a lot of this, um, some of the funding really went to things like that, just to make sure that kids can stay uh, comfortable while they're outside. I always say um, there's no weather that uh, can keep me from going outside. You just don't have the right uh, equipment. Uh, so, you know, that was that was a really important thing that we learned in this process is we tr when we tried to uh, address equity. Um, and so these are some of the, the, the bigger dollar amounts that were, uh, that were given out through this program. And uh, again, this was bipartisan, incredibly popular, and uh, you know, really across the board helped all kinds of different, you know, it could be an arts and class, uh, arts and crafts class, it could be fishing, it could be mountain biking. Um, Minneapolis Nature Preschool does some really cool things with just uh, outdoor classroom type spaces. Uh, and uh, my favorite uh, actually of everything uh, that, we, that we got done was in uh, Minneapolis Public Schools through the All Nations High School program, which is targeted at uh, native students is that they have had the opportunity to go uh, hunting on tribal land to do a bison hunt. They also got to do uh, ice fishing uh, on Lake Mille Lacs, which is a big lake uh, in our state where uh, for some of those students, that was the first time they had been uh, using their treaty rights to go fishing. And so uh, incredibly meaningful programs that we're doing uh, here in Minnesota uh, when it comes to No Child Left Inside. Um, so the, the other piece to that that I wanted to talk about is sort of this, this equity piece is really what is a challenge. And what we find too often is that folks, uh, we find that this in the Outdoor Heritage Fund, which is one of our legacy funds that, well, the there's nothing uh, outwardly racist or difficult on the application to apply for the funds. And so therefore, if people don't apply, well, then maybe they don't need the funds. And the, the reality is that um, so many of our systems have not been welcoming to so many parts of our community that uh, that was one of the reasons we did uh, the No Child uh, Left Inside grant program the way that we did is that uh, the DNR actually worked directly with me and others to make sure that the application was very simple um, and to make sure that we were very clear that this was a new program and that everybody was welcome to apply. So it isn't, and it's not to say that some of the bigger orgs aren't doing good work. Um, but it tends to help the same groups of people. And we can continue to protect public land throughout the state, but what does it mean when most of our residents can't access that public land because of transportation, um, because of, you know, other barriers? And so that's really what my focus has been, you know, as a as uh, the only Ojibwe legislator uh, in, in the state of Minnesota right now, you know, I um, I kind of play the role of existing kind of in between these different spaces and sort of bridging the gap too between, you know, all of our, our hunting and fishing orgs and the outdoor recreation community is, is also really important. Um, finally, I, uh, I know this is an outdoor recreation focused event, but I actually uh, have been encouraging folks to think more about it uh, as far as outdoor engagement. Um, and I I think uh, one of the earlier speakers touched on this too, that it, it's more than just a fun thing to do. It's more than just uh, an activity or a hobby, you know, access to meaningful experiences uh, in our outdoors and especially our public lands, uh, it's more than a nice to have. It really is a must have and it has a really important uh, long-term impacts on the health and well-being of everybody in our community. And so that's really where our focus is on making sure that everybody and especially our young people uh, have access to those opportunities. And so we actually, uh, it's not across the finish line yet. As I mentioned, we're still in budget negotiations, but uh, my bill this year to continue funding No Child Left Inside also sets up an outdoor engagement account, which is very similar, was modeled partially after New Mexico's equity fund um, to allow a way for private investors to be part of the public funds that we are putting in through our general fund dollars uh, to expand the amount that we can spend uh, on those grant programs. Because obviously, uh, if we get more kids out Outside and then they're taking up fishing or they're taking up snowboarding or what you know biking all those things the reality is that those dollars are going to be then spent in the community you know it's sort of tying back to that that economic piece that's that's really important um, 
so so that's I that's that's those are the things I wanted to share with you all. I'm I'm sorry I didn't have more uh, organized slides, but I I look forward to questions here uh, as as we wrap up the presentation and um, encourage folks to to reach out to me. I'm very there are only four Becker fins uh, that exist. So if you Google me, you will find out how to contact me um, and, and happy to talk more. And also uh, really invested in helping other states if they're interested set up similar grant programs because um, ours has been beyond successful here in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Representative, um, especially for making the time today in your busy schedule. Um, a reminder for everyone, if you do have a question, please go ahead and put that in the chat in the lower left hand corner of your screen. Uh, for the final portion of today's webinar, we will explore several federal initiatives underway. Our speakers from the Department of Interior are B Brian Bloodsworth and Joel Lynch. I will introduce them both briefly as they are splitting time. Now, Brian is the director of the Great American Outdoors Act Program Management Office. He provides executive leadership and serves as a key advisor and consultant to the department and its bureaus on opportunities and issues related to the GAOA, National Parks and Public Land Legacy Restoration Fund. He has been with DOI since 2008 and during his tenure has led a variety of large and complex projects. We also have Joel Lynch. He has worked for the National Park Service for 20 years and currently serves as Chief of State and Local Assistance Programs Division. The division administers the Land and Water Conservation Fund, State and Local Assistance Program, Federal Lands to Parks Program, and the Urban Parks and Recovery Program. Before his federal career, Joel taught at Michigan State University where he received a PhD in Recreation Resource Management. So Brian, we will start with you. Actually, uh, Jen, if you don't mind, uh, Joel's gonna start and, and discuss the Land Water Conservation Fund and then I will uh, pick up after Joel. Go right ahead, Joel. Okay, uh, great, thanks. I, I just uh, I know we're getting um, near the top of the hour, but I did wanna put a plug in because our communications director asked me to. Uh, the Park Service, and I'll try to find the link and put it in the chat, uh, released the it, NPS visitor spending effects for the last year, 2020, uh, and the impact being $28.6 uh, billion that was spent in national parks uh, and you know, local communities surrounding the park. So I'll put that press release, uh, the link to that press release in the chat box uh, after I, I'm done talking. So I'll jump right into it. I do appreciate the opportunity to talk about Land and Water Conservation Fund and the various programs uh, it funds uh, within the National Park Service. And, and that includes both within the units themselves, the park units, the national park units themselves, and then communities across the nation. <clears throat> um, I'll touch, I'll first start off and just say, you know, the Land and Water Conservation Fund has um, evolved over its 55 years existence. Uh, and I'll just mention sort of the two last amendments because they kind of significantly play into where we are as a result of the Great American Outdoor Act uh, that passed in, in August of last year. So the first amendment was the John Dingle Conservation Recreation Management Act that actually uh, permanently reauthorized land and water uh, and more importantly established sort of a min, min distribution of the $900 million of annual uh, funding that is to be distributed. Uh, and that minimum being between the different programs, there's a, a federal component, a federal land acquisition component, and then a state uh, assistance type component. And so there was a 40-40 uh, split between those two with 20% uh, remaining for <clears throat> um, however the, it deemed fit for um, either Congress or the administration to, dis to disperse. So the Great American Outdoor Act created this uh, permanent fund, the $900 million, uh, and more importantly, started the distribution process. And that's done through the president's budget uh, where they do the distribution of $900 million and then Congress can either agree or provide an alternative. So Congress is both involved on the, the front end of that too as well. So the three uh, programs within the National Park Service that receive funding, and I'll start with um, just the, the federal side, and this is the acquisition of land, waters, and interests uh, within the NPS boundaries themselves. Uh, NPS has identified about a, um, 1.6 million acres of privately owned land within those boundaries at an estimated $2 billion. So the Park Service has a sort of bottom up process starting with the parks themselves, uh, a regional review and selection process, and then ultimately a national uh, selection process. 
And so just to give everybody a sense uh, in terms of that process and how it all works for this, uh, but this upcoming budget fiscal year 22, which was released a few weeks ago, um, the budget request for National Park Service had 33 projects estimated at, at $56.5 million. Um, and that was to acquire about 130 acres within the National Park Service. So that's just to give you a sense of, of the, the, the impacts associated with land and water on the federal side of the program. And of course, um, the land management access um, or the, the um, uh, other components to the land and water program also deal with uh, Fish and Wildlife, um, um, National Park Service, the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management. So the other program, and this is the program that I oversee is the state and local assistance program. And it, it's a 50-50. So it's talking about leveraging all the different types of uh, grant programs that you've heard out there. Uh, and it's for acquisition and development of public outdoor recreation. So parks, everything from state parks to county parks to local parks to parks right in your neighborhood themselves. Um, so this is a formula-based program, and then I'll talk about another uh, program. The formula-based program was really what was auth reauthor authorized through the Land and Water Conservation Fund uh, in 1964. So the way this works is that distribution of the hundred, of the nine hundred million dollars that comes to the National Park Service um, gets apportioned by formula, uh, and then is um, uh, communicated to the governors in each state. And, and it's done by formula based in the act and it goes to the states, the territories and the District of Columbia. And that program um, is really a state-based program, meaning that the state, it's the state's responsibility to run the competitions, to select the projects, which ultimately get uh, passed up to the National Park Service for uh, approval and, and obligation of the funds. The other program, um, which is relatively new, began with a directive from Congress in 2014. It's called the Outdoor Recreation Legacy Partnership Program. And as Jessica had mentioned earlier about uh, the pandemic and the, the identified areas of, of real need in different communities across the country, it really focused in on that. We call recreation gaps or, or play deserts within communities. So that partnership program focuses on addressing those needs, particularly in urban areas. And to give everybody a sense of the amount of funding coming into this program, uh, in 2020, for the formula side of the equation, we, we apportioned 227 million. And remember, this is just the federal, federal portion, so it's matched at least 50-50. So you're talking significant impacts there. So the Great American Outdoors Act really grew the program. So for fiscal year 2022, um, in terms of the budget's request, uh, the president's asked for essentially $328 million. So essentially we're talking another additional 100 million being pushed into the program uh, for that formula-based program. And then 118 roughly in the competitive program that I mentioned, the ORLAP, the Alpha Recreation Legacy. So that's a total impact for just that fiscal year, should Congress agree, uh, for $446 million. And then the last one I'll mention real quick, um, and somewhat folks might be surprised, but Land and Water also supports the American Battlefield Protection Program, uh, which was authorized in 1996. Similarly to, to the program I oversee, it's 50-50 matching grant program that goes to states and tribes, to local units of government, uh, and also slightly differently to nonprofits. It focuses on uh, Civil War, American Revolutionary uh, War, and a War of 1812 sites. And they've got essentially three different types of programs. There's a land acquisition program, which is fee simple or easement. Uh, and then two new programs that I think were authorized just this past year, uh, grants that provide uh, two states for interpretation of those sites and also restoration of those sites. So I'll stop there and turn it over to Brian for the remaining few minutes we have. All right, thank you, Joel. I appreciate that. Um, you wouldn't mind, uh, Jen, advancing to the next slide. Um, I am here to, to speak to the portion of the Great American Outdoors Act that falls under my scope of responsibility in the department's program management office, which is the Legacy Restoration Fund, um, as we're referring to it, or LRF. Um, and the primary purpose of, the, of this part or component of GOA, um, as you see reflected on the slide here, is the reduction or the elimination of deferred maintenance. Um, 
there are a lot of I, one of the most frequent questions I get um, or feedback we get uh, around uh, the LRF component of implementing the Great American Outdoors Act is, you know, how are we picking projects or what what is what goes into the, the criteria, the portfolio, of the projects you picked, um, and what can we use what can we use this funding for? There's lots of great ideas out there. Not all of them are deferred uh, maintenance reducing in nature, and so that is always kind of uh, my first question is, is it is it the project that you have in mind something that is uh, intended to eliminate deferred maintenance at a at a national uh, park or a wildlife refuge or a Bureau of Indian Education school um, or a Fish and Wildlife Service refuge? Um, those were the four bureaus that were funded um, that received Great American Outdoors Act LRF funding. Um, and, and so that is our North Star, DM reduction, high percentage DM reducing projects. Um, for those of you that may have um, familiarity with what the Department of Interior reported in its um, end of year, fiscal year 20 uh, financial statements for the uh, amount of deferred maintenance that existed um, at, at September 30th of 2020, it was uh, roughly $22 billion of deferred maintenance. Um, and so what this funding uh, stream gives us Assuming the Legacy Restoration Fund is fully funded every year, um, as I'm sure many of you all know, the, the revenues that fund the Legacy Restoration Fund come off of federal energy revenue um, or energy revenues on federal lands um, in the preceding fiscal year uh, up to and not to exceed $1.9 billion per year. That includes the U.S. Forest Service's share of that. Um, but those are then somewhat our, our uh, further decreased uh, by sequestration um, as a result of the Budget Control Act. So it's a little bit less than that. Interior share of that is 1.6 billion per year. Um, so that is a tremendous amount of money and I greatly appreciate and thank everybody on this call that played a role in getting this historic piece of legislation passed um, because it's gonna have a tremendous amount of benefit. It adds up to about $8.1 billion um, over the course of the five years that this program is authorized. Um, again, that's compared like relative to a $22 billion problem, but it, it, it points us in the right direction. It makes a sizable dent in, in uh, the, the needs and the priorities of the department and, um, and the benefits that it will have to citizens and outdoor recreation. The project uh, macro level criteria that, that all bureaus uh, in interior are using to select projects you'll see reflected on the screen here. Um, they range from improving the financial health and reducing our deferred maintenance, right-sizing our portfolio and, and leveraging to the maximum extent possible this investment, um, as well as addressing the largest cross component of, of uh, citizens that we can, uh, that includes expanding outdoor recreation access and public access to our lands. Um, safety was a huge component too, especially um, across all bureaus, like uh, including the Bureau of Indian Education, where the student population, the teacher population are largely going to be benefited by these dollars. But especially in the Bureau of Land Management, if you look at so many of the projects in their FY21 and 22 project lists that are now available, um, fire suppression was a huge component um, of, of some of their prioritization. Um, and then last but not least, making sure that we are not just knee-jerk kind of reinvest or uh, fixing facilities that no longer serve um, a mission purpose, but really thinking about the future and thinking about how we can best support conservation and recreation and education opportunities going forward. So um, earlier, in, in our project uh, year in FY21 and uh, more recently in FY22 that just went in with the president's budget request. Um, project readiness was a big component of that. We started to get at the tail end of um, the, the inventory of projects in the pipeline that are shovel ready and ready to kind of hit the ground running. So we, we will, as we start to look at our, our list formulation for fiscal years 23, four and five, um, that will become perhaps less of a, con a consideration, but a, a, an important piece of this uh, is around the, the out of reach or high cost projects. That has been a, a major consideration in project selection, particularly at the National Park Service where um, our average project size in, in fiscal year 21 um, across all of the department was about a little bit more than $9 million. 
that jumped up to about a little bit more than $20 million in FY22. So it just goes to show that the projects that we're picking are projects that we've traditionally had a very, very hard time getting to because they would consume such a significant size and portion of our annual funding streams that they would either have to be broken into very bite-sized chunks and done over a very long protracted period of time or that, that they just would not get done at all because they were so far out of reach from a funding standpoint. What, what does that mean to some of the needs at smaller parks and medium-sized parks that have that may not have multi-million dollar funding needs um, or projects that meet some of these criteria? Well, essentially this injection of funding uh, really helps free up the funds that are available in, in some of our traditional funding sources, line item construction, recreation fee, um, and federal land transportation program funds that are all super, super important tools in our toolbox. Um, and so there's a lot more money to go around in those, in those funding areas that would not have traditionally been available if we had pursued these projects. Um, next slide, please. So I wanna just give you a quick overview of our project portfolio for FY21. Um, I'm going to make this very brief because I know we're, we're beyond the top of the hour and I, I know there's supposed to be some time for Q&A here, um, but this gives you a little feel for our, um, our project portfolio. Uh, in the upper left, you'll see a, a kind of a stratification of it for fiscal year 21, how, how projects looked in terms of funding size. We had $1.6 billion of fully funded legacy restoration fund. Um, that is going to allow us at project completion of the 165 projects that we have identified, we're going to eliminate roughly a little bit more than $1.2 billion of deferred maintenance. Um, you can see the transportation and non-transportation split. About half of the department's uh, deferred maintenance backlog is transportation in nature. The act uh, limits our ability to address transportation investments to 35% over the life of the fund. Um, and so we will be managing that very closely. Um, you can see in the upper right hand corner that most of our 21 projects were procurement ready, about 47% of them um, fell into that status. Um, and, and so that just goes to show that a lot of our projects were ready to hit the ground running. Um, and, you're, and many of them have already started. We have about 70% of our projects have, have initiated already for our fiscal year 21. Um, investments. Um, you can see in the pie chart in the bottom right about the distribution across the portfolio of transportation investments versus non-transportation investments by dollar. And then in the bottom left, you can see the distribution of the funding across states. Um, we have 165 projects in 33 different states. The darker the green, the, the, more, the larger the amount of funding going to those locations um, in ter U.S. territories. Um, next slide. It's really important to mention here that we also, in fiscal year 21, two, two of those projects that, I, that were part of that 165 project count um, funded what we call maintenance action teams. And so some of those states that did not, you did not see filled in on that previous slide will very much be filled in with our maintenance action team strike forces. Um, these are mobile construction teams that will be going around and, and doing high DM reducing projects all across the country. So when you combine our, our line item projects that you, that you saw on that previous screen with the maintenance action teams that we have envisioned, we have full coverage of the United States plus a, a, a couple of US territories, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, and the District of Columbia as well. Next slide, please. And then th this last slide um, is the look at our 22 portfolio. This has not been approved yet. This went in with the president's budget request. Um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, this basically is, you can see we have a higher average project cost in FY22, it's about 20 million. Um, you can see in the upper right hand corner, the breakdown of how those projects um, uh, uh, break out across the four bureaus. Um, you can also in the bottom right in the pie chart, get a, a feel for how the, the, the nature of the projects. We have a pretty good chunk of water and utility projects um, in transportation projects. Um, buildings and structures as well, and, and then recreational assets. Um, we, we 
And these categories I, I want to just emphasize are not mutually exclusive. Um, there's a lot of uh, what we classify as building and structure or water and utility can very much have benefit to um, recreational uh, opportunities. A perfect example being, you know, the the water lines and the what wastewater and sewers, you know, sewage systems at you know South Rim in the Grand Canyon, for example. Um, cute, you know, that provides access to a lot of you know a lot of outdoor recreation opportunity, um, and it's categorized as a water and utility project. So these are not mutually exclusive, um, but this gives you a little bit of feel of what we're doing across our fund years. We have three more years to come. And what I'll leave you with is, um, I know one of the, the questions we often get is how can how can we better position our state or better position um, you know ourselves for more Great American Outdoors Act funding? I would encourage you all to very much start those conversations at a local level. Talk to your park superintendents, your wildlife refuge managers, your BLM state offices. We are formulating these projects from the bottom up. Um, these are this is not a top down heavy handed initiative from the department telling bureaus which projects to fund. This is very much a grassroots effort where, again, the North Star is, is deferred maintenance reduction. Um, and even if your state may not be getting as much as another state um, with respect to Great American Outdoors Act funding, the other thing I want to emphasize is the funding that this Great American Outdoors Act, uh, these projects free up from our traditional funding sources like line item construction, recreation fee, federal land transportation program, which are major funding sources for all those bureaus, um, that, that gives us a tremendous amount of kind of all of the above complementary funding approach to looking at other projects and other funding sources that we can bring to bear to address all of the deferred maintenance needs that exist out there. Um, obviously, in order to keep our backlog from growing, we're going to need more annual maintenance dollars as well, our annual operating and maintenance dollars to keep the backlog from continuing to grow. But this Great American Outdoors Act funding is a significant boost to addressing some of our highest priority deferred maintenance needs across the department. So with that, um, that's the end of my presentation and I'll turn it back over to our presenters. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Thank you so much to all of our panelists and attendees for joining. We have obviously gone over time. I think the best thing to do would be just to follow up after the webinar with those of you who had questions. And please reach out if a question comes to mind. My contact information is right here. Uh, so have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you.